coming up on Arirang News. South Korea marks West Sea Defense Day, commemorating the soldiers who lost their lives defending the country from North Korea. President Moon says South Korea has the capability to fend off any provocation. The International Monetary Fund raises its growth forecast for the South Korean economy this year, citing its strong exports and government support measures. The IMF calling for growth of 3.6 percent. And with new cases of COVID-19 refusing to come down, the authorities in South Korea decide to extend the social distancing rules as they are for another two weeks. It's 5 o'clock p.m. here in Seoul. Thanks for tuning in to Arirang News. I'm Devin Whiting. President Moon Jae-in has expressed concerns over North Korea's latest missile launches, saying they're not helpful to efforts to resume dialogue. He was speaking at today's event for West Sea Defense Day in remembrance of those who died defending the country. Moon called for efforts to revive dialogue, but at the same time stressed that South Korea has the capacity to defend against any provocation. Kim Min-ji has more. South Korea and North Korea and the U.S. must continue efforts for dialogue. That's President Moon Jae-in on Friday at an event to commemorate West Sea Defense Day, remembering the South Korean troops who died defending the country against North Korea's provocations. His remarks come a day after Pyongyang fired two short-range ballistic missiles into the EC. But he also made clear that South Korea remains firm in its readiness to combat all types of provocations. Moon said that while the country will stick to the principle of demilitarization on the peninsula, South Korea's defensive missile capacity is world class and no one can invade the country by land, sea or air. He also introduced South Korea's new military assets, including a powerful frigate that will set sail in the West Sea from 2023, and a 30,000-ton light aircraft carrier made using domestic technology that will be complete by 2033. <laughs> Moon added that the defense of the West Sea is South Korea's pride, something that must create unity among the people, which in turn is the nation's strongest defense. Held every year on the fourth Friday of March, the West Sea Defense Day commemorates the troops killed in the Second Battle of Yongpyeong in 2002, the sinking of the warship Chanan in 2010, and the shelling of Yongpyeong Island the same year. Kim min Arirang News. And a day after firing two short-range missiles, North Korea has confirmed that the ones it launched were new tactical guided missiles. However, the regime's state media say Kim Jong-un was not there in person to watch. Our Kim Dami has the details. Confirming its first launch of ballistic missiles for about a year, North Korea said Friday that it test-fired new tactical guided missiles the previous day. The regime's Sierra News Agency reported that the North's Academy of Defense Science conducted the launch of two missiles that accurately hit the target set in the sea some 600 kilometers off the east coast. This is a further than SARS Joint Chief of Staff's analysis of 450 kilometers. Without specifying the projectile type, the North called it a weapon system with an upgraded warhead weight of 2.5 tons. Unusually, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un did not oversee the test. Instead, the vice chairman of the Central Committee of the Workers' Party, Lee byung chul watched over Thursday's launches. It was widely expected that Kim Jong-un would preside over the testing. Instead, he attended a ceremony to break ground for building homes for his people. It's a distribution of work, and he toned down the provocation by not overseeing the tests. With the Biden administration due to unveil its North Korea policy in the coming weeks, these latest launches also came just four days after the regime fired two cruise missiles into the West Sea. Thursday's provocation also marks the North's first launch of ballistic missiles since President Biden took office. Kim Dami, Arirang News. And President Biden on Thursday gave his first press conference since taking office. In it, he said clearly that the U.S. considers North Korea's latest missile test to be a violation of U.N. Security Council resolutions banning the regime from conducting nuclear tests or launching ballistic missiles. Hong Yu reports. 
U.S. President Joe Biden delivered his first warning to North Korea on Thursday, calling the regime's latest short-range missile launch a violation of the U.N. Security Council resolution. Let me say that, uh, number one, uh, the U.N. Resolution 1718 was violated by those particular missiles that were tested, number one. We're consulting with our allies and partners, and uh, there will be uh, responses if they choose to escalate. Um, we will respond accordingly. A stark contrast to his muted response to Pyongyang's provocative warning earlier this month against the South Korea U.S. military drills and its launch last weekend of two short-range cruise missiles. But he also stressed that his administration is prepared to engage in diplomacy with the regime. But I'm also prepared uh, um, for some form of diplomacy, um, but it has to be conditioned upon the end result of denuclearization. So uh, um, that's what we're doing right now, consulting with our allies. U.S. State Department said Thursday that it condemns what it called North Korea's destabilizing ballistic missile launches. It also said that the North's nuclear and ballistic missile programs constitute serious threats to international peace and security and undermine the global non-proliferation regime. It was much more direct this time in calling Pyongyang's provocation unlawful. This is in stark contrast to how the Trump administration had focused on bringing the North to the negotiating table. And this time, the State Department also brought up its commitment to the ironclad defense of South Korea and Japan, clarifying that while North Korea's short-range missiles are not capable of reaching the U.S. mainland, they are a threat to its allies. The U.N. Security Council Sanctions Committee on North Korea is expected to meet Friday at the request of the U.S. to discuss Pyongyang's latest launches. Hong Yu, Arirang News. The International Monetary Fund has upgraded South Korea's economic growth outlook for this year, citing strength in its exports and the government's economic support packages. It's now calling for growth of 3.6 percent, which also happens to be in line with forecasts from investment banks. The IMF also commended Seoul on its effective COVID-19 containment measures and its economic policy response. Om ji reports. The IMF has raised its 2021 growth forecast for South Korea, citing stimulus programs and strong exports. In a report Friday, the agency said they expect the South Korean economy to expand 3.6 percent this year. This is an upgrade of 0.5 percentage points from its previous forecast in January. The IMF said growth is being supported by solid exports due to stronger external demand and the gradual normalization of COVID-19 related factors. The agency's upward revision also incorporated the impact of the latest supplementary budget, which was passed by the National Assembly on Thursday. They explained that it would allow a positive physical drive for this year, helping pandemic hit workers and businesses and providing resources for the COVID-19 inoculation drive. The IMF also welcomed the country's credit support programs, especially for small businesses, and said they should remain in place until there is broader economic recovery. They also commended South Korea's capability to contain the virus effectively based on sound macroeconomic fundamentals, enabling the economy to weather the shock relatively well despite the pandemic. However, the IMF said several factors pose as downside risks to the economy, including renewed surges in infections and slower vaccinations either at home or abroad. It also said consumption and services activities have been sluggish with employment still lagging behind the pre-COVID-19 level. Going forward, in order for a faster recovery, the agency stressed that expansionary physical policy and supportive macroeconomic policies should be maintained over the near term. Also, the IMF said the country should closely monitor and be prepared in the event of rapid household credit increases and the pressure in the real estate market. Om Jiyong, Arirang News. 
And another sign the South Korean economy may be turning the corner. According to the BOK, consumer sentiment this month rose to above 100, meaning there are more optimists than pessimists. At 100.5, it's the highest reading since January 2020. From the month before, it's up 3.1 points. The BOK attributed the rise to the rollout of vaccines and stronger exports and the belief that the economy will recover as the pandemic comes to an end. Next week, South Korea is going to announce a set of measures to eradicate the use of insider information to speculate on real estate in the wake of a scandal involving public sector employees. Finance Minister Hong nam Gi said Friday that the measures will mean that public sector officials face stricter standards and responsibilities. There's been a huge public outcry over allegations that employees at the state housing corporation, LH, used non-public information to buy land before it was set for development. Despite the scandal, the government is going ahead with its plan to add hundreds of thousands of new housing units to stabilize the market. It's going to announce more locations for those units next week. There seems to, be, to have been little headway so far in freeing the cargo ship blocking the Suez Canal. It's turning into a logistics crisis, costing shippers and consigners huge losses and forcing some to consider a detour around South Africa. Min Soo Kyun has more. A massive cargo ship stuck in Suez Canal has caused major disruption in one of the world's busiest waterways. With no signs of the ship budging for a third straight day, shipping companies are considering navigating around Africa to avoid the gridlock. In a statement, Danish shipping giant Maersk said it's looking into possible alternatives, including going around South Africa's Cape of Good Hope. But it stressed that nothing has been confirmed and the decision will be made depending on how long the canal remains jammed. The German container line, Hapek Lloyd, also said it was closely assessing the implications on its services and is looking into possible diversions around the same route. Among the more than 150 vessels currently awaiting passage is a container ship from South Korean firm HMM. One of our 24,000 TU container ships is on standby near the Suez Canal and it's been there for two days. A decision on whether to make a detour around South Africa will be made next week after reviewing the situation. While rerouting around South Africa significantly increases the trip's length, which would add extra costs, shipping companies appear to believe that a prolonged blockage in the canal will lead to bigger financial losses. On Tuesday, the ship Ever Given ran aground amid high winds, blocking transit in both directions of the canal, which connects Europe and Asia. Currently, efforts are underway to refloat the cargo ship. One of the things that they did last night after they attempted her, they started taking the ships that were behind her in the canal out. So they have removed all three vessels that were in the canal that were following her, supposed to be heading northbound in the canal out. That tells me they're expecting this to go on for a, a little longer period of time. Almost 12 percent of the world's total trade passes through the waterway. The blockage in the canal is expected to disrupt global supply chains, and according to UK shipping news journal Lloyd's List, it's causing a loss of almost 10 billion US dollars of oil and goods per day. Min Suk Kyun, Arirang News. South Korea has still not managed to shake its third wave of the coronavirus. New cases today surging almost to 500. Officials have extended the current distancing measures for another two weeks. Kim Yun-sung reports. South Korea on Friday reported its highest number of new daily infections in 35 days. Friday saw 494 new cases, up 64 from Thursday. 471 of Friday's cases were local transmissions. With the number refusing to dip under 300 for 10 weeks straight, health officials worry that public fatigue with social distancing might start to simmer over.
But even so, Prime Minister on Friday said current distancing measures will remain in place for another two weeks. The government will stick to the current distancing measures and keep a ban on meetings of more than five people for two more weeks, starting next week. The capital region will maintain level two distancing. The rest of the country will be under level 1.5 measures. But with spring kicking in, so are new concerns about virus prevention. As more people visit parks and attractions to see the spring flowers, we have concerns about more infections popping up. We will impose special prevention measures in parks, forests, amusement parks, and at local festivals from March 27th to April 30th. In an attempt to nip the third wave in the bud, the government also says it will see if prevention measures are being abided to on transportation services, at resting stops on highways, and at places nearby or related to public attractions. But amid concerns, there's a silver lining, as South Korea has the third lowest number of confirmed cases per 100,000 people among OECD member states, only trailing New Zealand and Australia. Kim Hyun-sung, Arirang News. Last year, South Korea had to cancel its cherry blossom festivals. As the pandemic took hold, people were even stopped from sitting in the park to look at them on their own. This year, unfortunately, the events will be canceled, but venues are at least letting people in. Kim do reports. Spring has sprung at last, but the winter called COVID-19 is yet to pass. This district in the southeast of South Korea symbolizes the welcoming of spring as it's famous for world-class cherry blossom scenery and a festival called Kunangje. But with COVID-19 ongoing and with the country under the effects of a third wave of infections, for a second year in a row, all festivities have been canceled. However, there is a bit of breathing room for the fans. This path along Yeojacheon Stream is possibly the most famous spot for cherry blossoms in South Korea. While the stream was closed for visitors during last year's peak season, this year people are still allowed to take a stroll and enjoy the flowers. Despite not rejecting visitors, the district isn't exactly asking for people to come. There were pros and cons to shutting down the venues last year. Of course, it was the first time we endured a pandemic, so we were inexperienced. However, we've lived through it for a year, and now people know how to act. Also, the economy has been really bad, and district's residents had differing opinions on whether to hold the kunangje this year, so we had to settle with this decision to not stop anyone from visiting at least. In 2019, the last time the event was held, more than 4 million people came to enjoy the flowers. While last year there were none, the district does expect some visitors regardless of the absence of events. We were visiting our grandmother nearby and thought since the festival is cancelled, there wouldn't be many people here. We felt safe coming, but there actually are a lot of people, so we're going to quickly look around and leave soon. Usually, the district would set up extra portable bathrooms and provide more convenient atmosphere for the visitors, but nothing of those this year. Plus, some activities that are likely to expose people or spread the virus, such as this monorail leading to the top of a local mountain overseeing the city, have been closed. The festival was supposed to kick off on the 27th this year, and after last year's cancellation, many had hoped that the show would go on, but reality forced organizers to think otherwise, something other events may have to face as COVID-19 continues past one year. Kim do Arirang News, Chine. In other news, the leaders of the European Union held a virtual summit on Thursday to discuss a number of pending issues, such as the need for vaccines to be distributed fairly, as well as the resurgence in several European countries of COVID-19. Lee Sung Jae tells us more. A shortage of COVID-19 vaccines, spikes in new cases, the feud with the UK, and a number of other internal quarrels. These were some of the issues discussed Thursday during a virtual summit among EU leaders. Among the hottest issues was the lack of vaccines available in the bloc. Three months after vaccination campaigns started, under 5 percent of the bloc's 450 million people have been fully vaccinated. According to German Chancellor Angela Merkel, 
the problem lies with production rather than the orders that they have been made. The problem with the vaccination distribution at the moment has less to do with how much was ordered and is more about how much can be produced on European soil. We have seen now that British production sites are manufacturing for Britain and the United States is not exporting, so we are reliant on what can be produced within the EU. In order to ensure a steadier supply, the EU's executive arm has proposed strengthening export controls on vaccines. The European Commission aims to force vaccine manufacturers, especially AstraZeneca, to deliver the doses agreed to in their contracts, even if the move is detrimental to non-EU nations. However, the conflict over fair distribution within the EU was raised. Austrian Chancellor Sebastian Kurz accused some countries of receiving more than their fair share as Austria led a coalition of six countries asking for the distribution process to be changed. However, the majority of EU members believe the current system is working well and instead said Austria is making a mistake focusing on AstraZeneca instead of diversifying its vaccine portfolio. To help countries struggling with vaccine procurement, the EU is examining ways to fairly distribute the 10 million additional Pfizer-BioNTech vaccines made available to the bloc in the second quarter. Lee Seung-jae, Arirang News. The U.S. and the U.K. are putting new sanctions on military-controlled firms in Myanmar. Washington has strongly condemned the military's violence against protesters and against young children in particular. Choi Min-jung reports. The United States and Britain imposed new sanctions on Myanmar, targeting the military's economic interests and resources. The U.S. Treasury Department on Thursday blacklisted Myanmar Economic Holdings Public Company and Myanmar Economic Corporation, two conglomerates that contribute significantly to the military's economic resources. This means that any assets the companies control in the U.S. will be frozen, and American companies and citizens will be prohibited from trading or making transactions with the entities as well. In a coordinated move with the U.S., the British Foreign Ministry announced on Thursday that it would also impose sanctions on Myanmar Economic Holdings Public Company. Citing serious human rights violations, the British Foreign Secretary said that the sanctions will help drain the sources of finance used to suppress civilians. Watchers say these sanctions are by far the most significant actions against the junta since the February 1st military coup. But some are calling for more sanctions with a faster diplomatic response. After the announcement, the U.S. State Department strongly condemned the authorities' continued use of violence against its own people, including young children. Making reference to the seven-year-old who was killed by the military, the department criticized that its abhorrent and brutal acts against children reflects the horrific nature of the military regime. According to the latest figures compiled by the Assistance Association for Political Prisoners, at least 320 people have been killed. Choi min Dong, Arirang News. And that brings us to the end of this newscast. Thank you for watching. More live news coming your way at 7 p.m. Korea time. As the weather warms and winter begins to thaw into spring, people are feeling reinvigorated and moving about more frequently.
Though we all want to enjoy the warm weather with those around us, we cannot become lax with the risk of COVID-19 infection. Because cold symptoms are more common this time of year and could easily be confused with COVID-19, we 